transporting this to the cloud. Yeah, Yo, he just said hi to Paul. You also know Soon May Soul. Dr. Soon May Soul now is That's joined right. us. My TA from last semester, my advisee. Yep. Hi, Soon May. You're muted, Soon May. Hi, Hi, Dr. Bong. So soon may help Paul with the smile project. And she had some of the initial ideas for building it. And she is a programmer building mobile apps at Stanford. So both soon may and Paul work at Stanford. Um, and so this is a unique event to have people coming in from other places and joining us. Yoyoi from Tokyo, Suzy Porn from Bangkok and I don't know if they have another country, any other countries in here I'm missing. <laughs> For sometimes with Florida is another country lately, Mink Young, and that governor you got down there is making that another country, but um... <laughs> you know Paul, don't you, Mink Young? I know, I know him, yeah. <laughs> it's been a while then. Um... I met him uh, when I was working as a your GA. We also have Amelia here who's from Japan as well. So we have two people from Japan. Uh, we have John Hitchcock who was um, in the doctoral program or in the master's program um, in, in IU and is now at North Texas. And so I said, John, John's a faculty member in ISD, Jeff Hitchcock, but not John Hitchcock. He's another person I could bring in here. Millie, he's in from, she's visiting from China. She's my former visiting scholar. We have a couple others from China with us as well. I think I count seven PhDs or eight now. So Paul, so people have come, people have come to hear you. Uh, Paul Kim was someone I was recommended to see when I visited San Francisco 15 or 20 years back, uh, a friend I went to graduate school with, her name is Dr. Okwa Lee. We went to Wisconsin together and I was telling her I was gonna show my son colleges in California. And she said, well, while you're showing him you colleges and you should visit Paul Kim. And so uh, my son, Alex and I visited Paul, I had, gosh, I don't know, 2005 maybe ish, six or something like that. Paul's got his doctorate from USC. He was born in Incheon, Korea, came over for his undergraduate degree and didn't know any English when he started in, in some private school in Georgia, maybe, or something like that. Public. And so what was that? Public. Public school in Georgia. He no no English, so he did know the speaking language. He bought giant quarter barrels of beer, invited everybody over to meet him. And that's how he got to meet all the his future peers and friends and so forth. And and yeah, he knows how, how, how to get people to mix it up and converse. Uh, but after that, um, Paul went to USC and got a degree in educational psychology and technology and is one who's very savvy with computer code and building stuff as well as with theory and research and has done research in many countries around the world, including in Thailand, where Sudhi Porn is, including in, um, in India and the Dominican Republic, but in particular in Palestine, he had a couple of published studies in ETR&D, which won awards at the annual AACP conference. He's won a couple of first place awards for his research that was done there. He was also did some award-winning work in Mexico and Honduras and other parts of Central and Southern Amer America looking at how kids in schools whose parents are migrant workers get access to education. And Paul's in particularly interested in students' um, literacy skills and trying to help them um, ramp up their literacy skills. And so he's been building different products, uh, games, many times the gaming products, but some just um, question asking systems. One is called Smile. And now I think it's maybe Smile Plus, which has an AI engine wrapped around the back of it that can evaluate the levels of questions that kids are asking. I don't want to give away too much of the farm here. I want to have Paul speak about the farm as well. But let's just say he's worked with blind children in India um, and they're able to utilize the Smile program and other systems, uh, as well as blind children in Dominican Republic. Uh, he's worked with children in Rwanda 
He's worked in many other countries I haven't even gotten to. I can't, you know, just so many. Um, he's created an organization called Seeds of Empowerment. And so you can go take, take a look at Seeds and become a volunteer and maybe help uh, Paul with his development or evaluation of the different products that he's had there. People like Ming Young has been involved uh, and, and Sun Mei have, have been involved and many others that I know, uh, my son included, has gone with him to Tanzania and to Argentina in, working with indigenous populations in, in Argentina, working with kids who really normally don't have high technology in schools in Tanzania. Uh, he had to get power generators to get the system to work and to utilize the SMILE program. That was 10 years ago or 11 years ago, they went off to Tanzania and did that. Um, and Paul has chapters in my book. He's written about my World is Open book. If you get this book, just read this part on Paul Kim and you can understand uh, a little bit about uh, his background in technologies and also my two MOOCs books, MOOCs and Open Ed in the Global South and Around the World. He's got chapters in the books and I had chat PDF generate questions for Paul based on his chapter in MOOCs and Open Ed in the Global South. Just before class, I put his chapter into chat, chat PDF, not chat GPT. And um, it can take 100, up to 100 pages for free. And this is the first question, Paul. No. So <laughs> I'll hold off on that first question. I, I think what we need to do is, Paul, I think I want to either have you introduce yourself better than the way I did or show the short video introducing the SMILE program that's three minutes long. Um, which would you like, which way would you like to start? Also, um, uh, Rachel has a bunch of questions for you and she's created a, a list in Canvas where students were asking questions and she's got a bunch of ready for you. So we can go a number of different ways tonight. Um, Paul, what would you like to do? Yeah, I'll just introduce myself. Don't watch any videos that I don't, you know, <laughs> that show me. It's so embarrassing to watch those videos. So, uh, Thank you, Kurt. Were you reading off of a, some sort no. of description or it just came out of your memory? You are incredible. You have yeah. a very good memory. Anyway, uh, my name is Paul Kim. I'm the Associate Dean and Chief Technical Officer at the Stanford Graduate School of Education. And then so uh, I've been uh, involved in ed tech for quite some time. And I was in uh, Oxford last week talking with uh, some professors at the Oxford University about developing new programs for refugee education. And the week prior to last week, I was in Lebanon working with the Syrian refugee children. Um, and I implemented a few projects there, including SMILE and 1001 Stories and other things. So uh, I'll be happy to share uh, some of that. But here, uh, here's the link if you want to read more about uh, my work in the past. I did some uh, publications around my projects, including Smile and 1001 Stories and mobile technology projects like Pocket School and farming simulation games for India, et cetera. So there's some papers you may want to grab some and read more if you are interested in. Paul, can I just interrupt you before you yeah. 1001 Stories is where kids are writing stories. That's and right. They get sold as a mobile app or a download. And, and that money that can be made off those stories comes back to the community as social entrepreneurship. They are used for scholarships for those children who participate in those projects. So uh, in fact, in, in uh, Lebanon, two weeks ago, we delivered scholarships to those children who participated in the uh, writing uh, project. So uh, that's that. But today I would like to focus more on SMILE project and where it is and what am I doing with uh, AI uh, in terms of uh, helping students ask questions? So if you're interested in, this is a, uh, a link that you can use and you can type in your question and get your questions um, evaluated. But before you do that, let me demonstrate how you can do this first so that uh, you will be able to do it yourself at any time you like. So let me share the uh, screen. Okay, if I know how to do that. Let's see. All right. Can everyone see the screen here? Yeah, we got the screen. I'm going to also put the link in the chat to all the Paul's 
web, websites and two videos. So you'll get that in a second. All right. So where am I? Which screen are you looking at? What, what do you see right now? Today's plan. Today's plan. Okay. How about this? Ask you, a question. Ask a question, right? So smile. How many of you read anything about smile? Raise your hand. Some of you. Okay. So smile, it, it stands for Stanford Mobile Inquiry Based Learning Environment. We started this project uh, back in 2010 or so. Uh, Some me, uh, when she volunteered to uh, the Seas of Empowerment, and then uh, we worked together to develop some programs that can help students generate questions. Back then, we thought that helping students formulate high quality question is a meaningful learning opportunity. And the questions that they generate are forms of uh, learning data. And so when you evaluate student questions, you know whether they have learned something or not, if they understand something correctly or not, you can learn a lot by analyzing student questions. So the SMILE project has evolved uh, and they uh, there have been multiple versions and uh, there have been SMILE Pi, SMILE Plug, uh, especially for developing regions where there's no electricity, no internet. So we had to develop sort of a portable smile school, uh, which is a server, Wi-Fi, antenna, everything all combined into one Raspberry Pi. And we still distribute that through our partners. Now, with, with the emergence of uh, artificial intelligence, we thought that maybe there's a way to uh, utilize it in evaluating Question. So what we do is we evaluate student questions and uh, based on the quality of the questions, we uh, give from level one to five. Level one meaning sort of simple recall questions. Level five means more of uh, critical thinking, creative, high order thinking questions. So as you, can you see this? How many colors are in a sun ray? This, have you, yep. can you all see it? So when I typed in this question, how many colors are in a sun ray? It says, I would classify this question as a level one, right? So AI thinks this is a simple recall question. That's why it is a level one. And then it explains. And it also explains uh, why it gave level one for this particular question. Uh, if I want to, uh, get level five, then we probably want to do something like this. I already tested this and making sure that it uh, it gives the uh, the level, a uh, higher level of question. So if I type in this question, in the sun, if the sun were to lose its red color in its rays, what are the potential impacts on earth? You see the difference between the first question and this? The first question is obviously, a, no one will have any problem labeling as level one. This one is a little different, right? So if I submit this question, it's gonna evaluate it and it's gonna give me the evaluation results. And it says, great job. The question, if the sun were to lose its red color in its rays, what are the potential impacts on earth is indeed a level five question. It says a level five question, it presents an uncertain situation by using the conditional structure Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Well done on formulating a, a thought-provoking question. So, as you can see, it determines the quality of the student question. That's how you know whether students understand something really well or not, or whether the question is simply asking for answer that you can easily find from Google search. A question like this, this is a little more involved. This requires much higher order thinking. So that's why this particular evaluation tool uh, gives us a higher uh, a higher level sort of uh, uh, evaluation. Now you're probably wondering, how does it work? So with the SMART project for the past more than 10, 12 years, we accumulated a lot of student questions. They're all pre-evaluated by students and labeled. And we use that data 
because they are all classified. We built a, a language model, and then uh, we were able to use that as a uh, sample resource for this to work. And with the GPT API call, what we're mixing here is the response from our language model and also with a GPT uh, API, the model that calls the, the, the sort of the, uh, it understands the nuances better. So it is much better if you combine it with the AI uh, API tool like a GPT. Uh, we could probably use other ones, but so far as of today, I would say GPT works better than other um, API models. So now you see the difference between level one question, level five question, right? No question about that. So we'll try a few more examples here. I already got some questions here. You can do even live coaching questions. So if you ask a question like here, what should I do in order to complete a doctoral degree at a top university? What do you think? What do you think the result will be if I submit this question? Go to Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> what do you What do you think the level that we will be getting from this evaluation? What do you think, Bo? <laughs> level two? two. All right. One, two. It, no one. Put it in the chat window. What do you five, think right? this is? A one, two, three, four, or five? Rachel says three. All right. Is that the highest so far? That's the highest so far. Okay. Yeah, let's I'll try. go with Rachel. I'll take three with Rachel. <laughs> She's always right. All right. This question falls under level two. Two. We're wrong, Rachel. Yeah. Um, requires the recall and comprehension of information. It does not involve high order thinking skills such as analysis, evaluation, or creativity. Do you agree with that result? Yeah. Yeah, sort of. All right. So then what is the better question? So here is a, a longer question. Let's try that. So can I, it, the question says, can I still aspire to become an aerospace engineer considering that I am a high school junior who was raised in an orphanage without adequate academic guidance and has consistently struggled academically, right? That's kind of set the stage. It sets the context. Additionally, I'm not proficient in math. What are the things I could start doing? And let's submit this question and see what kind of evaluation we get. This is pre it's much more detailed in, than the other question. Do you agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, if the question is a little more complex, it's going to take a little more time. And here, it not only gives the evaluation, as you can see, your question is already at level five. It describes an uncertain situation, and incorporates a conditional structure. Considering your background and challenges, it is important to offer you encouraging and motivating advice. And then it even gives an advice. Very uh, long, lengthy advice. And when you read it, you can do it yourself since you have the link now. It does the coaching really well. So it not only evaluates the, the question quality, but it provides coaching. It's a personal coaching. We all talked about personalization and coaching, right? Now, finally, it, it, it kind of, it, it works in that direction, right? All right, so that's the uh, ask, smile thing. Now, there are some research opportunities. Uh, and I, if any of you are interested in sort of a, using this tool, uh, to do your research, if you are interested about leveraging AI and question evaluation and things like that. So I welcome any collaborative research and publications. So my, one of my colleagues is doing a research with this. And what is she doing is basically comparing how AI evaluates questions, the results that, that are done by the AI and comparing with the human evaluation. So uh, she's asking the same questions to teachers and have teachers evaluate those questions and then see if the human evaluation versus the AI, if there's any correlation or not. So that's one type of uh, research question that's being uh, um, answered through a research. 
Another thing you could do is look at the question quality uh, over time. And if students are practicing formulating questions over time, does the question quality improve over time? And how frequently do students use this system in generating questions? And how long do they stay in the system to formulate questions? And, and if they use this mo uh, model to learn certain concepts, do they retain the knowledge better or longer? And also we do NLP, natural language processing analysis, to see if their vocabulary uh, dimension is increasing. So if they are picking up more vocabulary as they are formulating questions around certain topics and then how their question structure change over time. And then uh, how about the perceptional dimension when students use this system, do they have the sense of trustworthiness? Because if you look at some of the coaching advice that you get from this system, it's pretty personalized and very convincing. And I've done a lot of questions for myself uh, about life coaching and that's right. Uh, and then it, uh, the results were quite impressive. I would say, this is somewhat uh, better than human coaches in some ways, because it, as you know, this GPT has a lot of knowledge in its model, right? So I can ask just about any questions, and then it kind of gives me the kind of um, in-depth coaching. So what are the perceptional sort of uh, uh, dimension that you can analyze when students are formulating questions and learning from it and interacting with it, do they get the sense of trustworthiness or do they feel like this is as a, as a real human or do they give more trust on this system more than humans, like, you know, et cetera, parents or teachers? If they use it a lot uh, for a, a, a certain period of time, do they, uh, have more dependency on it. So there are a lot of questions that we can explore with this system like that. But the idea is we like to help students develop their critical thinking, creative thinking uh, by generating uh, questions. And we use question as research data. So that is the latest and I, I'll show you one more thing. Paul, before you do, we have a question here. Edgar's got one for you before you go to the next thing. And I oh, have okay. one. Yeah, what, what's so the question? Edgar, your question is? Yes, it's related to languages. Uh, oh, okay. I've seen that uh, <clears throat> because sometimes you, you lose the, the translation. That's the one. If it's yeah. in Mandarin or in Mandarin or if it's in Spanish. The good to, news. To help out. <laughs> yeah, the good news is that it works with all languages. Oh, terrific. And the, the second one is that uh, will you be able to have a voice activated button so you don't yeah. have to write, you can just speak at yeah. it and, and it'll do it too. Yeah, I have. I ha So my previous project was a more, more of a voice interaction type. Uh, we haven't built it for this particular uh, system, but that's very easy to do. So right. Paul, my question is, what percent of people in the higher ed level with working with adults versus working in the K-12? Does it work in both spaces? And, and all spaces. How, how, and, how, and how easy is it to download the client and get it to work oh, for a teacher to understand how to use it in his or her classroom? Yeah, there's no downloading uh, or anything. You just go to that site link and then just start using it. Okay. And so when I announced this, tool uh, a few months ago at a conference with about a thousand people uh, I, I i just announced the link and then i uh, ended up getting twelve thousand questions from the audience and then so what what i'm doing is i'm analyzing all the questions and it, it's interesting to see that some some people have posted like one question and then they are done with it and i've seen some people putting like 40 questions and they just keep on going and going and going. And so I see what I'm now doing is if they are putting multiple questions, I want to see how their question changes over time. Um, so 
I'm writing a paper around that as we speak. So the next tool that I like to introduce is, um, let's see. Drop this in the chat room here. Okay. You see that link? Let me uh, share the screen. And Paul, Carol has a question for you, Carol. Yep. Are these questions about any topic? Uh, can we ask questions about like something more specialized, like a pathology or histology or engineering? Any topic. You can you can do it yourself. You can try it yourself after. I am. I want to pay attention here, but I'm tempted to yeah. go there. Yeah. <laughs> Try it, try it, and let me know what you think. Eamon has a question, Eamon. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, my camera was closed. So I, I was asking, I'm really curious about examining the, the correlation uh, between like the results as, that the students get like in their tests and actually their scores when they're asking questions. Is there is any like, have you ever like thought about something like that? For instance, if like someone asked about pathology, I think, if like the students ask this question and get like certain scores, is it related to actually their understanding of the curriculum itself or it is just like about their critical thinking skills? Uh, so question evaluation focuses more on what cognitive or metacognitive uh, response is required to answer the question. So that's what it's evaluating, not necessarily whether you, memorize certain concepts or not it does not you know test that so what is required to respond to your question is what this system is evaluating yeah but i mean like in order to ask good questions you need to understand the concept really well that's that's what i meant like, yeah so if you so that's why it is important to see what kind of questions you come up with if you ask simple questions, simple recall questions, like what, what is a rainbow, you know, that's, then you know, oh, wow, what, are, what kind of question is that, right? So you kind of know what the student is coming up with. But if student says something like, I'm curious, because if the red color from sun ray is removed, what would be the uh, actual impact on earth? And then you might want to ask, like, how did you come up with that question? I think that is very, thought-provoking question. So that kind of gives you an idea. The student has curiosity, first of all, and then has some hunch about certain questions. And then it kind of opens up a whole new dialogue. It gives an opportunity to uh, have more in-depth analysis on what students are thinking. So that's why I think it is important to see what kind of question. So, what I believe in the future, as the AI is being developed and becoming more advanced every day, tests like SAT, what is the value of exams like SAT? I'm not quite sure. Unless it changes to be something else, I think what students ask is way more valuable than what they memorized and then um, if they come up with things that you can easily find in Googles, I don't know if they are any valuable in the era of artificial intelligence. So that's why I've been working on this for many years. And I get more people agreeing to what I'm saying, that it is important to help students develop critical thinking, creative thinking, and also inquiry skills, because how you formulate your inquiry to interact with AI really determines your competency. In the future of workplace, that's what we will be doing or your children will be doing, right? It's not about searching in Googles and you know, getting answers to particular questions. It is about your inquiry skills. And I think that's a new competency that our future generation must have in, in order to Paul Vera has a question. What if the what if the question contains an incorrect understanding? And Rachel had a problem when she inputted. Rachel, you want to explain what your the problem was? 
So Paul, you talked about uh, watching a particular person input multiple questions and following along to see how their questions developed, which made me think about how are you tracking the user? And so I asked Smile, uh, why is there no terms of service for the Smile project? Because I would, as a user, want to know if it's tracking me. And the answer was, I'm sorry, but I can't assist with answering this, that question. Mm -hmm. So when you type your question, it is evaluating your question, not necessarily trying to answer your question. Does that make sense? And in terms of a tracking, we've tracked by IP addresses. So if you are sharing your computer with your sister, we will not know whether you or your sister generated a question. We'll con consider them as your family question. More question? Uh, Vera, did you want to bring your question up? Yeah, I was just one to do him. Yeah. I was just wondering, are you going to be able to correct students when they their question, even if it's a very good question, but it's actually it actually has incorrect information. Yeah, well, that's correct uh, incorrect questions. Yeah. So we have a smile platform, which I will be showing in a few minutes. Uh, there is a way to not only this. This particular system that I just presented to you is for you to practice, you know, to, to understand what level one means, what level five means. But in an actual classroom, we use a smile platform and we will be working with smile platform uh, today. So uh, let me uh, continue with my presentation. Thank so you. Uh, the next set of tools that I want you to try is, I don't know if you uh, you are there or not. Let me see. Um, are you looking at this screen? I shared the link with you, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. So the Ask Smile is the tool that I just showed you. You know, this is where you can practice formulating questions and getting the evaluation from uh, level one to five, right? Other games that I have developed is guess the word, which is pretty straightforward. Subject, you like music? Let's pick music. Choose grade level, fifth grade. Start the game. It's gonna randomly pick a word and it's going to ask you, a blank is a group of three or more notes played at the same time. Does anyone know the answer to this question? Or Chord. Corey? Can Repeat you that, that up Corey. for me? I think she said chord. Corey? Can you type it? Oh, chord. Chord. All right. Forward, forward, submit. Yes, you're correct. We should we should up the grade then. The fifth grade is too easy for us then. Huh? It's my daughter who has musical talent, not me. Oh, okay. Yeah, so have her try it. Have her try it. So as you can see, this is a guessing game and you can start the new game and then choose a uh, higher level, maybe graduate school level, and then go to music and let her play with it and see how far she can go, all right? So that's the uh, guess the word game that we have developed. And you can play with your child. And let me go back to here. So here's a, another game, two words. Two words, randomly pick two, two words for you and you have to make a sentence making a meaningful sentence using these two keywords you must use these two keywords elephant and guitar who wants to try i have not met anyone who gets 10 so this gives you a score from 1 to 10 so far no one has gotten 10 but i'm sure in this group you probably have some great idea. Okay, so here's the first one. The guitar's neck is as long as an elephant trunk. Let's see what kind of a score we get. Evaluate. It's 
Two. You got two. <laughs> Great effort. However, the sentence does not use the words elephant and guitar in a relevant way. Try to find a connection between the two words and create a sentence that demonstrates that connection. So you probably want to come up with a sentence that is creative. Yeah, creative, something that's creative. All right. Does it, anyone want to try it or should we pick two different words? Carol, you have, you raised your hand. You want to try it or should we, did you? I, I sent it in the chat. Oh, okay. Let's see. Elephant tail. Okay, let's turn that. All right. So let's type that in and then see what we get. Evaluate. Two. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 All right. Maybe it, it maybe it's too hard. Let's pick two different words. Elephant and castle. That's even harder. Oh my goodness. It likes elephants. Yeah. <laughs> Same for some reason. But you get the idea. The idea is to come up with a sentence that create creatively linking these two words. And then it, it's to test your creativity, basically. You know, how creative are you? And how can you make a creative, meaningful sentences with the given two words? So this is another exercise. All right. Up and down. This is another game. All right. So up and down game, it's similar uh, with the rest of the game. Basically, what, what it does is it, here's the rules. Yeah. Whenever play A says something goes up or increases, play B must say something goes down or decreases as a con consequence of what player S A said. In the next turn, if the player B says something goes down or decreases, player A must say something is going up and increase as a consequence of what player B says. So in exchange of responses between the two, the logic must be correct and meaningful. For example, player A will say, when the air pollution quality decreases, there'll be more patients with pulmonary diseases. Player B must repeat the last part by starting with when there are more patients with the pulmonary diseases and adding that what happens as a consequence. Who wants to try? So let's, let's start with a sentence here. If the... I see it's increase. Then what comes down? There will be less people. Okay. Does that make sense? All right, let's send it. When there are less people buying cars, there'll be more demand for public transportation. Okay, now it's your turn. So if Demand increases for public transportation. What comes down? What is decrease? What is decrease? What goes down? Traffic. If there are less people buying cars, okay. So, if, all right. How do you make a complete sentence? So, the sentence will have to start. There'll be more demand for if. There are. Then what it what decreases? The cost of mass transit. Increase. Make sense? All right, send it. The cost message will be less people. Increase less people using public transportation. It makes sense, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It makes sense. So you get the idea. You have When you play with this system, you have to think about what goes up, what goes down, the consequence. So I developed it. Uh, as a part of a leadership skill, when people 
demand for something, you have to know what the consequence is. You, you cannot just demand something. You can't just ask for higher salaries because your company may go bankrupt, right? So you always have to think about consequences. And so this is another activity that helps students develop the, the uh, critical thinking, creative thinking, which I believe is a, an important element in leadership training. So you get the idea? This is great. Can, can we take a pause for just a second? Um, we have Susie Porn from Sandra Panra from Bangkok, and her students have arrived, a bunch of them. I want to make sure Susie Porn doesn't have a question. And then uh, we have Minjin Duane from, from Beijing, she, my former advisee. I, I want to open the mic to either Minjin or Susie Porn. Either one of you have a question or a comment for Paul. Hi, thanks. Um, I like the idea of the GPT using the um, education, and I actually um, did something with the chatbot, but still old version. And um, there's one thing that I came up with the uh, my experience with using the GPT and the um, the research uh, project. I think um, uh, it's easy for us to create um, intelligence. Uh, uh, system for um, the content that we teach, but still for real teacher, like teacher in the classroom in, in K-12, they don't have experts um, in um, AI. And it, I was just, this is um, uh, my, um, my imagination that I think it might be too difficult for them to use GPT. What would you suggest if they don't have um, basic knowledge in AI, and they want to start using GPT for their content and developing some of the something like this, the system for their students. Yeah, so all these tools are using GPT API calls. So we're using GPT, and it's pretty mm -hmm. simple to play the games. You know, guessing the word is very simple to play. Two words is a little hard. I've never seen anyone getting ten as a score. So you should. Try it tonight and then see if you can get 10. And let me know, take a screenshot and let me know. I'll give you a sky tour over Stanford, OK? And uh, Ask Smile is easy to use. Up and down, maybe a little more involved, but uh, it gets you to think deeply about consequences and logical thinking, et cetera. So I, the reason that I'm developing all these things is to help students develop leadership skill. And when I, Whenever I travel to various developing regions, I always focus on identifying potential leaders who can change, not only change their own lives, but also their countries, right? I want them to have a hope. I want them to have, uh, um, a you know, I want them to promote peace in their region. And I want them to promote democracy and that's why I develop these tools and introduce these tools to the children who are living in de developing regions. I think we need these here in the U.S. as well. Um, the, in terms of using AI and tools like GPT, and this is the easiest way to get them involved. And okay. we can help students understand how GPT works behind the scene. And obviously, we can get them to use GPT, uh, chat GPT directly as well. I have curriculum for that as well. Um, there are many ways to introduce these tools to students. What I think the most important thing is we have to get them to experience it. And we have to give them tasks that require mm -hmm. them to use, right. use GPT and any AI tools in similar oh. manner. And otherwise, they will not be able to survive in the future. There will not be useful workforce in the future. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, all right. Any other questions? So, Susie Barn, thank you for that question. Did Minjin want to jump in here? Um, do, do you want to ask a question for Paul? Any Min other Jin? Is your mic working? Oh, she's she's muted. So, okay. Uh, does anyone else? I know Rachel has like twenty questions that she hasn't asked yet, and she's collected. Does anyone else want to jump in here before Rachel does?
you being more quiet now. Um, so, Rachel? Okay, um, so you've answered some of my questions already. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, but I would like to ask, um, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to using SMILE in classrooms of various levels or contexts? So that's a very good question. I've been implementing SMILE in many, many countries around the world. The biggest challenge was with the teachers who do not uh, like this inquiry-based learning model because students ask all kinds of you know, creative questions and they don't have answers. So teachers don't have answers and they feel embarrassed and they do not want to lose the uh, sense of authority over knowledge. And so that was the biggest challenge because a lot of teachers do not admit that they are not the single source of knowledge anymore in the 21st century and they do not accept that. So that's been the biggest challenge. However, when I introduced these tools to uh, sort of uh, high-end schools, they all welcome because these activities are very natural for them because that they've been doing things like this. You know, they've been doing a lot of critical thinking activities and so forth. So uh, that's what I have found so far. Bahar has a question for you. Bahar. Hello. Hi. Hello. Excuse me, I have a question. Uh, my question is that uh, I maybe I missed the part that you talked about uh, analyzing the level of question. Because I am a K-12 uh, teacher, so the main focus of uh, my uh, uh, learning uh, and teaching process is based on Bloom taxonomy. So I want to ask that in analyzing the question, do we look at that um, taxonomy of learning objective and yes. so on? Yes, I Bahar, suggest where are you... you from? What, what's, oh. what's country? Uh, I'm uh, from Thailand, Mahidol University. Okay, great. I thought great. so. Yeah, I implemented uh, SMILE in Thailand as well. The students were great. They came up with amazing questions. In Chiang Mai, especially Chiang Mai, the, some of the rural areas near Chiang Mai, the kids from first graders were generating amazing questions. Uh, the only the person did, who did not like those questions were the teacher. <laughs> so uh, it was a very interesting observation. But anyway, if you read some of my SMILE related papers, you will see reference to Bloom's taxonomy. And then uh, it will kind of self-explain how we came up with the evaluation results. And also uh, there are uh, the, the components from GPT API call that helps us uh, streamline the question evaluation as well. So I'm working on that paper right now. Uh, unless there's any other question, I will, like to take you to the this real smile platform hey paul can i ask one of the questions that chat pdf came up for you oh uh it wants to know chat pdf analyzed the paper paul wrote and it asked this question it said what inspired you to pursue a career in educational technology and how did you get started i don't want you to give the full answer just give us a couple because could, we could talk for hours i know we we need to show these up but yeah what, that... what inspired you into this field yeah, so if I I usually give a lecture about that, but uh, if I want to, you know, just talk about that in a few seconds, I I studied computer science for my bachelor's degree, and then I had an opportunity to teach a, a rather tutor a child who was in a fourth grade uh, level, and she could not read um, or do any math, so I had to tutor her, and then um, she picked up everything that I taught her or helped her understand in terms of reading and doing math. And so I, I felt that, wow, I could change her life. You know, education is such an important profession. And I decided to use my knowledge and skills around technology in education. That's a simple answer. Big round of applause for Paul. If anyone wants to unmute your mics, we can clap for him, yeah. <laughs> All right. We need him. <laughs> okay, you can show us the other. 
Yeah, platform. this is the uh, this is the real smile platform. Uh, the latest version, it, it has been evolving and there are multiple versions of a smile, but this one is sort of the latest version in progress, I would say. The reason that these tools need to evolve is because technology changes. You have to upgrade all these systems based on what browsers or what operating systems they come up with. So I want you to go to this website and create an account and log in. And I want you to go to, I want you to find this, IU Instructional Design Group. I want you to create an account, log in, and join this by clicking. And we have a warm-up activity waiting for you. Can you do that real quick? Are you already in? We now joined. All right. You can just use the Google or you can actually set up your login and password and join this. This is the actual smile platform where you type in your questions, evaluate each other's questions, comment on each other's questions and reflect on question rationale. Oh, fail to sign in with my IU account. Can you then just try to set up your login and password? Does that work better? Yeah, I don't know about IU um, with, with this. All right, so you find this group. Okay, I see a whole bunch of students joining in. Great. So once you join, you can click on the warm up activity. And this is where you type in your question. Okay, you can put a multimedia component like photo, URL things like that. And you can decide whether you want to put a multiple choice question or open-ended question. This is where you type in your question. And before you start typing your question, I want you to uh, look at this image and try to come up with a level five question. You, now you guys know what level five means, right? And level five question on this topic. Okay, here we go. Can you see this photo? Create a level five question after you examine this photo. What are you thinking? What comes to your mind when you look at this photo? Let's see who can come up with a level five question. Let's see who can come up with a level five question. If you do come up with a level five question, I'll give you a, again, sky tour over Stanford. You can look down on Stanford from a little airplane that I fly. We'll do that. So try to come up with a level five question regarding this scene. All right. A bunch of students are generating questions right now. Who came up with a two plus three question? <laughs> Wina, I want you to generate a question regarding the scene that you're looking at. 
Oh, no global warming. We're, we'll, we're generating a question about the uh, photo that we just looked at. All right, so I'm going to pick a question from here. Okay, so I we got some good questions. All right, how much time do we have? We have as much time as you want to give, but we should end pretty <laughs> soon. We, you know, okay. We don't want to keep you too yeah. long. So if you maybe I five agree. or ten, you know, right. or fifteen max. But yeah, we. Right. Yeah. So I. I just picked a question and we're going to ask at the uh, here again, this page. Let's see what kind of, oh, before we do that, we should ask each other uh, before I do this. We want to. All right. So if you put a uh, Post it to your question. Could you evaluate these questions, your peer questions? You cannot oh. give yourself five rating. You cannot. You can only evaluate your peer questions. So click on your friend's questions and give uh, how many stars, whatever the, whatever the, the question deserves, give a different number of stars. Paul, we've got several people, and happened to me too, where the screen was shaking. Is that because too many people were in the system? Shaking? Yeah, it was shaking. The screen was shaking for me. And uh, Lena too, and um, Nadi as well. Um, we had to enlarge the bro my browser window, it says. Okay. All right. Shaking? Um, not sure. Uh, can you refresh? Refresh the screen? Does it still shake? It's not shaking now, so. Hmm. It's interesting. I think it was just doing it while we were typing, actually. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Interesting. Anyway, uh, I want you guys to evaluate your peer questions. Is this the reflection of the sentiment? It got only two stars for this question. Emmanuel's question got only two stars. Is that, are you thinking the US department is not doing enough about this? Is that why you are giving two stars? Or are you ev actually evaluating the quality of the question itself? Boy, these everyone came up with brilliant questions. All right, I see a question that has a four stars. Are we supposed to uh, classify the questions according to Bloom's taxonomy and answer somewhere? Uh, here, you just pick the number of stars you want to give to a question. Um, if we uh, if if we think it's a five. Yeah, just if you think it's five star question, then choose the last star on the right. Five star in the taxonomy, in the Bloom taxonomy, or just five star because it's an awesome question? <laughs> uh, it's up to you. Okay. At the time, if you think that it is a sort of an evaluation question, application question, you can give five stars. If you think it's an awesome question, give five stars. 
If it is a simple recall question, then give one star. But I like to choose this question here. If Ruby bridge, bridges did not help to desegregate schools, would schools will still be segregated today? That's a very interesting question. So I'm gonna copy. Since we're running out of time, we will go back to the AI and let's see what how the AI evaluates this question. In Peer evaluation situation, this question got four stars. Let's see, what level do we get for this particular question? It's got level five. Congratulations. <laughs> AI thinks it's a, a level five question. So I think AI may be a little more generous. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So you can you can play with this and see if there's a difference whether uh, it agrees with your evaluation result or AI is too generous. You can kind of uh, see it yourself. So um, I rushed through everything today. <laughs> I wish I had several hours. So we can talk about a lot of these things, but uh, I. I guess that means we have to meet again. Yes. We'd love to have you back. Oh, 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 I have uh, one last thing here. I have one last thing. I have one last thing. Um, all right. Here's the survey. I want you to do the survey. And if you complete the survey, you don't have to do it right now. You can do it later. If you do the survey, you have a ticket to do the Sky Tour over Stanford. Okay. What is the Sky Tour? Remind huh? us. What's the Sky Tour in sky your plane? Tour? Yeah, of course. I'll be flying. Uh, let me show you what you might be looking at at night. Here, you see the background of my. Uh, you see the background of my. Zoom here. You see the background. Yeah. This is what you will see if you fly in the Bay Area at night. I love night flying, but if you like day flying, that's fine. We you can see Golden Gate Bridge, Appen Bay, San Francisco, of course Stanford, Google, Apple, Meta. You can fly over all those companies. Yeah. So it's it's a beautiful. I guarantee you, you're gonna enjoy it. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. <laughs> Just do the survey and let me know. So, so that's any, all I have to say today. Any Back more to questions? Oh, you have questions. questions from anyone here? Who hasn't had a chance? Claudio, we haven't heard from you at all here. Uh yeah, Dr. Kim, uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question. Have you seen any kind of difference between um, the development and the use of this particular tool with the students in higher education and middle schools? Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, if there are any uh, particular difference, but you know, the younger students, they tend to ask more questions, more creative questions. But if you go to rigid school you know, programs, if you've been in rigid school programs too long, you don't ask questions. You just try to memorize everything that you hear. And if you've been exposed to too much teacher-centric classroom activities, then you become very passive. So I have noticed that kids, students who have been a uh, self-regulated learners who have a lot of curiosity, who ask a whole lot of questions, they do really well in this type of activity. However, if you go to some developing regions where only thing that they do is try to memorize everything from textbook, they don't do well in these activities. Uh, Jill had a comment. Jill? 
Yeah, thank you, Dr. King. I like your lecture and smile project so much. I'm starting to think about how teachers and researchers can probably do some research and teaching application on your smile project. For example, I'm wondering if anyone is doing the learners' cognitive process when they are communicating with the probably to chat GPT. And if they are do they are and they talk they chat with the you would uh, I mean their peers, yeah. I, well, I are, think the cognitive process must be different, yeah, even they people, work with yeah. Yeah, a lot of people are doing research with the ChatGPT uh, in in education settings. Yeah, I, I'm especially in the cognitive part. I I think yeah, obviously. Uh, yeah. In terms of uh, measuring the sort of cognitive engagement, yeah, uh, and the process process, I think. Yeah. So yeah. If, if you're dealing with the younger uh, students, uh, I'm not sure what measures that they use specifically, but for um, sort of a higher grade students, or you know high school college level yes it definitely becomes, it's easier but the younger children uh, it, it might be a little challenging but uh i haven't seen the specifics of it but i i am aware that there are a lot of people who are doing research with the gpt and they probably can be a tool for my students to challenge me i think yeah, all these things create. Yeah, it's a good tool. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Paul, Vera wants to know if anyone's using it in medical schools. Yeah, Smiles have been used in medical school a lot uh, at Stanford and other universities as well. So I don't know what defines success, but uh, students uh, thought that these are a lot of uh, thought pro provoking and intensive in terms of uh, cognitive engagement they they enjoyed it but they said it, it's not it's not an easy thing to do to formulate creative questions on some of the terms that they learn and principles that they learn and they have to come up with a multi-dimensional creative questions so they said it was very challenging but it was worthwhile um, Emily was one of the first ones here, and so I, and she was so excited to come. And she hasn't talked. Um, Emily, did you have a comment for Paul Kim or a, or a question? I don't know if that was for me, Doctor Bonk, um, but I do, I do have There's a two Emilys. That's right. There's two Emilys here. <laughs> um, I do. So uh, I work in um, secondary setting, middle school, high school setting with teachers, and um, can completely. It, what you shared about the um, hesitation maybe of teachers to to invite AI into their classroom because they are used to being the content area expert. Um, I'm just curious about your thoughts about either modeling the, the use of your tools for secondary teachers, whether you believe in a more prescriptive approach to providing them tasks that they could use. I think about the the workload that's already on their plate. And I could see the resistance being, how am I supposed to think of tasks that are meaningful? Um, so do you do you know anybody or are you creating tasks that teachers, ready-made tasks that are standards aligned that teachers could use with their, teach, with their students? Um, or do you think it really is just a mindset shift that we have to, to start to, to embed in our teachers so that they, they can come up with the task themselves? Yeah, we need transformation at all levels. So not just the teacher level, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, leadership and governance, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. I've been asked to advise the Korean government. Mm -hmm. uh, they are in the process of creating new digital textbooks integrating AI as mm -hmm. we speak. And so they asked me how to do that. And I gave them some examples. And the examples that I have given are like, you know, give students a task uh, which involves, so for example, um, you feed multiple pages of, let's say, uh, financial statements and ask questions like, 
oh, give me a summary of the transactions over the last uh, past three months and categorize them in five different categories and show me the patterns and uh, summaries of the transactions, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not doing Excel sheets anymore. Mm -hmm. That error is yesterday. Mm -hmm. Now we are dealing with a whole new kinds of tasks that we can perform today mm -hmm. using these AI tools. So what will our students to do when they go to work in the future workplace? It's not about just how to use Excel, how to use Word. Th that Those days are gone. And we have to give students ample opportunities to practice solving new kinds of problems that require the use of AI and multiple levels. And the future textbooks will need to be uh, in integrating a lot of these new kinds of tasks, much more complex tasks, uh, and the tasks that require a lot of cognitive, a deep cognition and metacognitive level uh, engagement. So uh, teachers today, I see some champions who are creating some simple tasks for students to engage in. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a very good start. Uh, however, uh, we we need transformation. We need reform at a, a, a at all levels in the whole education ecosystem today. Otherwise, it, it's just not going to work. You know, teachers will not have enough time to cover their units for the high stake exams. At the same time, try to teach them about new tools. It's just not going to work. So it, it requires everybody's attention in. The time is right now, and I don't know if if there's a enough attention to these matters in education today. You, I'll be giving... you are you are the ones who will need to pave the new way. The twelve well, tasks. Thank you. I'll be giving two talks: one in the fall, one after Christmas break, on pedagogy with ChatGPT for contact North in Ontario. Those would be offered free for anyone to take and still being designed. Um, the other, Emily, did you want to have the final word? Any comments? No, I'm just, I'm excited to learn a lot of this. In my current role, we have a lot of mainly our secondary teachers and are very hesitant and scared of AI. Um, my team and I have done a lot of presentations to show them how to not necessarily embrace it, but how to use it in appropriate ways with their students and, and with them um, in a professional role as well. So I'm excited to see where all of this goes. Yeah, we, we don't have time to be afraid of these things. We, we just don't have time. We have to work on these new tasks that can challenge our students to engage in a much higher order thinking and uh, creative thinking. Uh, and problem solving. So, uh, yeah, we 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 are really uh, facing a, a this timely challenge that we must embrace, and uh, we have to use it, and we have to come up with appropriate uh, projects and problems for students to solve. All chat PDF gave me more questions for you, and there are two here I circled. One you just answered. One was, how are governments around the world responding to the rise of AI in the fourth industrial age? And the Korean government has, has asked you to help embed AI activities and components and you know curricula in their textbooks. So, I mean, that's one answer. The other question that I circled for chat, GPT, it says, um, you know, how do you envision the role of AI in education evolving over the coming decade? Oh. You can think of it as Steve Jobs, you know, showing the first Apple, the iPhone, you know, that's a 2007 and see what we can do with the, with the phone. We, we literally use the phone for everything, right? We pay for things, you, you know, you communicate, you do all kinds of things that we didn't imagine before. So same thing will happen with AI. You know, we, we don't know what we will be able to do in the future. Uh, but what we know is for sure that we'll be able to 
do a lot more things in a much more creative way, in a much more efficient way. And what we need is how are we going to leverage these the tools to make the world a better place for all? And I think that it's not about just getting people to be smart or intelligent, but how do we make this place a better place for all? And I think that's something we need to think about as an educator, we are creating a journey for our future leaders to not only just think for themselves, but think for others, have empathy, have compassion, and solve problems out there, make this place a better place. And that is the purpose of education in my view. And so therefore we are doing a very important work today. So I would like to say thank you to Paul Kim in a unique way for us tonight. If we could all stand up, uh, I'll stand up too. We're, we're at a jumping off point here in AI and education. So if you could stand up with me on the count of three, we're all gonna jump for Paul Kim. One, two, three, jump. One, two, three, jump. One, two, three, jump. And everyone, <laughs> everyone go like this. The world is open and I'll get your picture for, for all of you on the screen here. One, two, three. Great, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming uh, tonight. Uh, so, but let, let's try that one more time because I didn't get the people on the second screen. Uh, okay, everyone hold up their hands on the second screen. Yes, Emily, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you, Paul, for coming and enlightening us in week three of our 622. This is Learning Environment Design. Paul taught the largest course ever taught on learning environments. He had 22,000 people take his massive open online class on designing a new learning environments. It's talked about my first MOOCs book in 2015. He had collaborative teams around the world designing learning environments. So if he can teach a course for 22,000 people with collaborative teams around the world, 22,000, I can teach this class with 18 people and invite a few friends from Thailand and China and other places around the world to join us. That's not hard. This is not hard bringing you all in. I'm, I'm delighted Yayoi could come from Japan, Sudipur and Min, Minjin and others have joined us from other countries and other places. So Alicia and Lena who are here right now, I wanna thank you and all Sudipur students, I wanna thank you right now. And I will mention before we all go, a surprise guest is coming on Wednesday at eight o'clock this week. We're gonna have Susan Bridges from the University of Hong Kong. She recently retired to Australia, but she's still working with the University of Hong Kong on designing interesting high flex classroom spaces. She was featured in Educause Horizons report this past year. It's the big report on the future of education. And she, there, the University of Hong Kong is in there. She happened to contact me about something else. I said, how would you like to talk to my students? She said, how about this week? So at eight o'clock Eastern time on Wednesday, anyone can come. It'll be, a, 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 I'll send you all her bio and everything. Uh, if you can't make it, it's okay, but I'll be, it'll be recorded. Again, let's clap for Dr. Kim tonight. Thank looking you, Paul. Forward to, uh, looking forward to flying with you soon. <laughs> I, I want to fly, but I don't want to go over Denali. I just, uh, I don't, I want to go over Meta okay. and, you know. Let's do it. Google. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Thank you all. Take guys, care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. I'm going to stop the recording to the cloud. We